Hey. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming to this uh, uh, panel and hopefully to engage in a discussion. So I'm Stefan Kandea. Um, I will talk a little bit about um, uh, issues uh, related to technology in uh, journalism in the context of investigative uh, cross-border networks. And then we have Brigitte Alster, who will uh, talk about issues uh, related to network infrastructures and try to organize such network infrastructures. And then Chris, will, um, Chris Chisen Mihai, will um, talk uh, uh, more about uh, spaces that could foster um, the ex experimental approaches and testing of different ways of thinking or of uh, uh, producing technologies in uh, journalism. Um, so I don't have slides. Um, I, will, I will start uh, and also try to uh, moderate this after we speak. We, I hope we can engage in a, in a conversation about uh, the topic and uh, discuss also your experiences. The, my, I come from uh, Romania and I'm involved in uh, investigative journalism for um, my whole career, basically, for the last two decades. I started as investigative journalism and because of the limitations I've noticed in the commercial, uh, commercial newsrooms I was working with, I got pushed towards uh, searching solutions outside and organizing in uh, networks that uh, networks of journalists that would do this kind of investigations um, across borders. And obviously um, that was the drive of a lot of other people two decades ago who would uh, realize the limitations of their respective uh, uh, newsrooms and also try to approach, um, uh, approach these issues from a network perspective and start to engage uh, across borders with other journalists. But um, that was the drive and the main motivation uh, back then. And um, now, uh, two decades after, I think, um, even with that motivation, but with um, an approach that we didn't think too much about, um, we kind of end up in the same corners. So uh, basically, we kind of either uh, create the new problems or recreate the same problems that we tried to solve. So uh, from a practical perspective today, uh, you have as a journalist to think what if, if you want to start uh, sharing information in a network of journalists, in the first place, what, what is the technology you would use? What are the tools you would use to, st to, to start working? And you don't have too many options. The second thing is to think again about what are the technologies you would choose to make uh, uh, documents available to other journalists. Again, not too many options. Um, so even if we have um, almost two decades of experimenting with uh, different uh, solutions to these questions, we end up, we end up with very few um, uh, solutions and possibilities and they don't really uh, serve uh, the purposes we uh, wanted them to serve and they recreate uh, actually uh, more problems. So I would just go um, a little bit and, and, uh, and describe what we tried, maybe uh, with concrete examples, uh, because in uh, the first uh, experimental years, let's say, we as journalists went out there and tried to collect a lot of um, uh, databases uh, in forms of uh, leaks or uh, even uh, stolen databases that were out there on the black market. We tried to put them uh, together and try to publish in different ways uh, information, not only as uh, articles, but uh, as resources for other journalists to, uh, to use for further research in different fields. Organized crime was our main uh, topic, but we also looked into media ownership and we tried to build our own uh, databases on that and make them available. Um, we, uh, we, we try to use uh, new tools um, to uh, have the journalists communicate with each other uh, when uh, working together. And um, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, of tools uh, that have been tested. Um, and I don't, 
I don't feel like we uh, still now we found the, the, the right one. And so we also try to build our own tools, which is a venture uh, that is uh, problematic uh, in itself for journalists to run tech projects. Um, and for us, we learn it the hard way because, yes, you could get a grant to do something and then you have to deal also with the issues of who will maintain that thing that you build and who will update those things uh, on a longer term and who will protect your, uh, your, your uh, tech tools on a longer uh, uh, time. And you get to be dependent on certain technologies or on a few people who can do that. Um, so uh, you get, you lock yourself basically. Um, what I could see that um, worked in this uh, space at the very beginning was that we could um, yeah, experiment uh, because we were few people involved in this. Now this kind of networks grow to a lot of people and that type of um, approach doesn't uh, really work anymore. So um, on the on the organizational side of, of our work, there was also, we tried a few things, mostly in the non-profit realm, trying to open up uh, new uh, NGOs, trying to open new networks of NGOs. Um, we went, um, we, we didn't build, we didn't think to build institutions necessarily, so basically we wanted to be uh, flexible in terms of, um, of the, the, the way uh, the work was organized and also the responsibility or the liability of the people involved was organized. But um, that type um, of approach didn't, um, didn't build much in the end. So you can't say that looking back there is something that uh, stays or that can be replicated uh, by others. So my issues now that I see in, in these networks of uh, uh, investigative journalism is that we, um, we are very slow in, in doing this progress with this type of work because we, the resources that we need and that we, we have to spend are not coming from the news industry itself and um, they, they come from big institutional actors uh, in other fields like you have the example of the DNI uh, fund have uh, projects that are done with European money. These are uh, slow uh, processes that push you towards um, longer cycles of, uh, of time from the moment you want to test something to when you, when you deliver. Um, now, I think um, also what I see is that because we went to this non-profit uh, direction with our approaches, we kind of got uh, uh, pushed uh, back towards the um, commercial media industry because donors usually ask for impact and measurable impact and this impact usually translates into uh, metrics like how many people read uh, your stuff and non-profit uh, journalists have been pushed back to work with the newsrooms that of like big names uh, that could provide this kind of uh, metrics very fast. And I would say that um, also in general there is uh, no space where such uh, work can be hosted or can be um, uh, can can happen um, on a longer uh, on a longer time frame. So there is no um, space like a laboratory for uh, for this kind of uh, of work. So the idea here was to um, discuss the approach towards uh, how such a space would look like in the European uh, context. So maybe I give it now to Brigitte to talk about her experience in organizing infrastructures for uh, networks of journalists. Okay, so I pick up the word European. I'm, I've uh, worked all, I'm a journalist too. I come from Denmark. I worked all my way up from being a local journalist to being a Brussels correspondent and from there I realized that if we do not collaborate across borders in Europe, we will never get the impact we actually need, uh, the, the, the counterbalance to the European power. So that's why how I got started with cross-border collaboration, uh, supporting networks of journalists who work across borders. And the, this method of working in a network, 
uh, is known to many of you if I say Panama Papers or Football Leagues, everybody is nodding, uh, which means you understand that this is journalists in different countries collaborating on a research and then publishing to each their own target group, which is the target group they know and where they are based. So, uh, in order to facilitate such networks between journalists, we organize an annual conference in Europe. It's called the European Investigative Journalism Conference and Data Harvests. And it is a working conference. It's not just a I speak to you conference. It's really a conference where people sit down and say, whoa, this is an interesting data set. Let's develop something together. And in the evening, they drink a beer, and next morning, they make a work plan so that on Monday, when they go back to their newsroom, they have something to work on. They have a data set. They have a story which is relevant to them and they have peers, contacts. Um, now, organizing this conference year after year, I can see that there are certain topics that are surfacing that are really pressuring. And one of these topics currently is housing, uh, which is something that we see in many, many European cities and towns, that the housing market is bought up by big investors. A British journalist called one of her articles the Wall Street Landlords, which is a, like a synonym for the big investors driving up the prices. And housing is something that is really important to individual people. So that my readers, the citizens, need housing. They need a roof over their head. If they're threatened to lose their flat, then what their kids go to school in the neighborhood? What about a drop if they cannot afford to live near the drop? And so on. It's very, very uh, personal and, and moves people. So we need, as journalists, this is a, we, ha we have a duty to address this. And I see a lot of excellent local journalism or lo journalism on local level close to where these investments happened, where tenants are kicked out of their flats and so on. And I don't see anything on European level, or I see very little on European level. Now, having ended my news career as a Brussels correspondent, I know that this is shared competence. So some is national competence, and some is indeed European competence, because it's direct investment, foreign investment. So my ambition is to bring together these journalists who cover housing. This is just the case. There are other similar topics where it is totally relevant to work together because if you do fantastic local journalism and you don't bring it to the people who actually make the decisions, then it will evaporate. It will, nothing will happen for the people who are in need. Um, so, so my ambition is to bring them together, make them work together, and then also still maintain the interactivity with the citizens who are threatened of losing their house. There's excellent work going on, but how do we create a network? How do we create a bottom-up network? How do we respect editorial independence? How do we then reach up to those who, who make the big decisions? So coming from journalism practice and coming from developing uh, this network infrastructure as we do in the European conference, I come with a question to people who develop tech. How can we safeguard the interactivity on local level with the citizens, and then how can we safeguard at the same time the network of journalists in Europe to then translate it on to hold those who are decision makers, who hold those people accountable and tell them, here's something you need to look at in favor of the citizens. In other words, I come with a challenge, and I don't really have a place to go to to look for a, a network tool to make this happen. Um, and it doesn't happen in the mainstream media because they are, as we all know, they're under pressure economic. So much of the development work that is necessary from a journalism point of view doesn't occur in the media industry. So we need to find or create a space, a laboratory, where these kind of needs can be answered and good tools, technology, networking tools, networking models developed to answer these needs. So I have a need. So I <clears throat> pass the floor to Chris, who has a background. Uh, he comes from the US, but has uh, already experience in Europe as well. So he could have both perspectives on, on this issue. Yeah, I, I come to colonize you. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking through the schedule, and almost every uh, you know 
two-page spread has a session about social media or uh, the internet or, or technology. And it, it's, it's an interesting, it's interesting to see this crisis because, uh, you know, thinking about fake news or, or, or social media, now is probably not the time to address the problem that Facebook has like however many billion users all around the world that it has. The time to address this probably would have been about 2012, 2013, right? Before Brexit and Trump. Um, uh, but even better, the time to address this would have been in the early 2000s when Mark Zuckerberg was first experimenting with the idea of Facebook. Um, and I think that this is uh, something that maybe, I, 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 I was a professor at MIT for about 10 years. I ran the Center for Civic Media. Um, I've been involved in technology work in the United States for a long time and also internationally. I think people don't understand as much outside of technology that technology is a culture. And, um, and in a sense, I mean, this is um, uh, what Bruno Latour says, technology is society made durable. Um, so you, you have a society and certain people have the money to make technology and what they do is they instantiate a technology that will make the world a little bit easier for them. Now, it doesn't make it easy for everyone, it makes it easy for the people who can afford engineering. Um, just to, to bring in another philosopher of technology, this is uh, uh, Andrew Feenberg. He says, technology is power in modern societies, a greater power in many domains than the political system itself. The masters of technical system have far more control over patterns of urban growth, the design of dwellings and transportation systems, the selection of innovations, our experience as employees, patients, consumers, journalists, then all the electoral institutions in our society put together. The legislative authority of technology increases constantly as it becomes more and more pervasive. So it's going in a particular direction. I think we can see it. But if technology is so powerful, why don't we apply the same democratic standards to it that we apply to other political institutions? But we don't. And so what I've been looking at is trying to come up with different kind of political formulations of technology that will yield different kind of worlds that we want to live in. Um, this panel, we used a, a term which we're very ambivalent about because of course it's the term of a military contractor that I hate that makes you know, many of the world's worst bombers and, and jet fighters. But they had this name which has become the kind of dominant name in industry and research called a skunk works. And um, it was actually named after uh, a uh, distillery during the, the era of prohibition in the United States, a kind of fictional distillery that um, while they were making the alcohol, it produced these crazy smells. And, um, and so there was this idea of this kind of secret lab laboratory where you create things. I'd say that a lot of our technical um, uh, history has been set by institutions like this. Um, so, you know, if you go back to the 1950s, 40s, 60s, um, Bell Labs was responsible for so many of our communication technologies. Uh, um, packet switching, uh, uh, telephony, satellite communications, many of these things were developed inordinately at, at you know, this one center, um, in, you know, at least on the American side, but I'd say also on the international side at this one kind of center. Um, similarly, Xerox PARC, if you're familiar with it, was an arm of this uh, photocopier company, um, kind of business technology company. But they developed, uh, you know, the mouse, the graphical user interface, Ethernet, laser printing. Um, all of these things kind of came out of one laboratory where basically they were given this kind of freedom to imagine. Not, not coincidentally, this era of technology was, you know, tracked very closely with the 1960s, with Paris 1968, with uh, a, a kind of a movement in engineering um, towards greater liberty. Uh, so, you know, I, I know this for a fact because I worked with, for instance, this guy David Reed on the left, who came up with end-to-end -end protocol, which was this very important protocol that allowed almost anything to travel over the internet, right? So there, the internet was made in such a way that was agnostic of what went through it, much like postal systems are. You put it in a box or an envelope, and then the post office shouldn't have any interest in what's passing through it. Um, and this is one of the amazing things about the internet, and it was kind of rose out of, even though it was funded by the Department of Defense, it rose largely out of the kind of um, interests of, uh, you know, these people. Um, his advisor was roommates in Berkeley with uh, uh, Carl Savio, who's uh, you know one of the the key figures of the Students for Democratic Society in the United States, so so how you influence this technology culture early on is really critical for the kinds of technologies that come out of it. What I'd say in Europe is you see a lot of institutions like the Oxford Internet Institute, which they say is 
um, uh, undertakes research and teaching devoted to understanding life online with the shame, aim of shaping internet research policy and practice, which is great, but you know, does Oxford, Institute, uh, Oxford Internet Institute have more kind of power over our technologies or does Facebook? I think the answer is pretty clear. And I think that Europe has been in some ways trapped in this process of responding to these American technologies that come from a very libertarian um, 1990s, 2000s culture of Silicon Valley, trapped in a, a pattern of you know, figuring out first, first the technology becomes ubiquitous and then you say, how do we regulate it? But at that point, it's probably too late and it's probably a process of catching up. And so I would say that Europe maybe should look at a couple of other examples. This is uh, the Berkman Center for Internet and Law in the United States, which is kind of like the Oxford Internet Institute, but I'd say that it's about half, well, maybe a quarter making, maybe three quarters analysis. But even the analysis is based on making in a very interesting way. So projects like Ethan Zuckerman's uh, um, uh, Media Cloud uh, is an example where you're developing data tools that then help you in the analytical process. But they also do things like Pacer, which was this great way to look at legal documents which you have to pay for, you have to do a search. Imagine if every time you did a Google search, you had to pay like a, a, a euro for each search result. That's what the US kind of uh, court system is like. And so they, they basically said, well, there's nothing illegal about republishing this. It's only the search that costs. So they basically produced a, a plugin from people's browsers, lawyers' browsers, that every search they downloaded would then upload it to a free site. And obviously this really disturbed the government. Um, but so it's a, it's a it's an kind of, let's say, technological activist uh, organization. My own center, uh, the Center for Future Civic Media, we created at the Media Lab, largely thanks to Knight Foundation money. I've been doing a lot of projects. I'll show one of them, which had to do with kind of protest and uh, alternative politics and basically trying to provide technologies for exactly the people who don't usually get technologies. And the Knight Foundation came to us and they said, okay, there's this old plum in American journalism, right? I'm sure you've all heard it, that the job of a journalist is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And they said, you've been doing the latter, can you do the former? And it was an interesting challenge to us because we'd really been thinking more about um, afflicting the comfortable. Um, but we said, okay, we'll take your challenge. And of course they were, this is the mid 2000s, they were looking at um, the kind of huge decline in local newspapers. And, and we said, but there's one thing that we have to agree on early on, which is that we're not going to try to necessarily save journalism. I'm sorry, uh, everyone. You know. we're, we're going to try to save community news and information because that's, I think that's the unit that we have to look at. And maybe it'll take the, the form of journalism, but maybe, maybe even likely it'll take other kinds of forms. Um, and so we created Civic in 2007, and that's how I got to know uh, Stefan um, uh, and, and kind of be, become uh, more exposed to the journalism community. And let me just give an example of where we tried to differentiate ourselves. I mean, so leaking is great. It's very interesting. A lot of the networks that you were talked about are based on leaking and a lot of your early work as well. But leaking has this problem, which is that you have a company and you know, they, some documents get leaked, and in the documents, you find out that the company was doing things that were bad for the people of this country or for the government of this country. But everything about the leak is really the, the company's own data, right? I mean, it's, it's about how the company was practicing. And so it comes already kind of filtered from the perspective of the company. Is that data the most important data for the community? Is that data the most important data for the country? Think about the leaks that you've seen. Was this problem the problem that the journalists were working on beforehand, or was it what they thought was the most interesting from a bottom-up perspective problem to work on? In most cases, probably not. In the end, leaks represent a very specific kind of information, and it's not necessarily the information that's most important to the public good. So I'd argue that leaks are like a very, very thin slice of the pizza, right? But most of the rest of the pizza gets uneaten. And as these leaks have been very successful for journalism, it's not necessarily that they've been successful for actually challenging the most important problems, the kind of cross-border problems that, that, you know, that are actually challenges to our society. So we basically were trying to say, what's a technology that we can do that takes a different approach? And so this, for instance, um, uh, was, was uh, uh, this is one of the more political projects before we started working with journalists, which was um, there was a problem around information technology and protest 
the, the government in the United States and the Bush administration was getting very good at figuring out how to prevent protests by shutting down protest information systems, seizing hard drives from indie media before the protests start, um, uh, basically clubbing the people with the walkie-talkies in the black block in Seattle. Um, and so, in, and, and they had steady cam drones that were starting to take pictures of crowds and uh, stingray systems that were, you know, tapping the phones of protesters. And so my students said, well, what if we came up with a system that didn't have a pre-existing database that was just basically used SMS, and this is 2003, so it was quite a while ago. And he basically built this system that shut down Manhattan. And what was interesting is after a while, the Wall Street Journal did a, a story about it after three days into the Republican National Convention when we deployed it the first time. And, and they asked him, uh, you know, uh, they asked the phone companies, are you comfortable with protesters using this? And the phone companies blocked our system. And so we basically said, can someone help us build a proxy like you, you, know, you have to do in many parts of the world to get free information out so that our traffic can you know, be channeled through this proxy? And uh, the guys who volunteered were, worked for a company called Odeo, which was a small video startup that wasn't doing very well. They helped us build the proxy. They had access to our open source code. And then after the, the RNC, they said, let's pivot to create a microblogging platform that um, became known as Twitter. So this guy, Rabble, was one of the people who helped us build the proxy, and they went on to hire Jack Dorsey and to, to pivot to become a microblogging company. And, you know, we were, this, this cost us like $1,500 or so to do. Like, I mean, this was like really dirt cheap, but because we were working in a space where no one else was working, we were able to create this innovation that was quite, I think, different from what anyone else was thinking about. Last one, this is after we, we were funded by journalists and started thinking about geographic communities that were no longer being supported by newspapers. So in much of the world, this is what Google Maps looks like when you zoom in. This is uh, Mil Flores in, in, in Peru, in Lima. But um, uh, the reason is because Google spends about 100 million euros uh, you know, on a satellite. And as a result, they've invested enough that they then fly that satellite mostly over New York and Paris and London and Tokyo and their, their main markets, right? And so a lot of the world hasn't been mapped in 10 years. Uh, where I live, there's huge parts of the island where I live that haven't been mapped in 10 years. And so entire coastline has changed because of storms. So we were working at the Media Lab, and so kind of to take the piss out of our boss, Nicholas Negroponte, my student Jeff Warren came up with one satellite per child, um, which was basically like a 60, 70 euro system to create a satellite that could then be flown by children. It's a balloon or a kite. Uh, with a disposable camera on it that could help them map their community. And so these, um, this is a community that's called a uh, Nuevo Invasion, uh, you know, like it's basically people who've been pushed out of the countryside because of extractive industries, um, settle in the, in the capital, but they don't have plumbing, they don't have power, they don't have, you know, um, uh, sewage. Um, or, or trash uh, or public transportation. So basically they would make these maps that are 10,000 times the resolution of Google Maps um, and many years more recent. Um, so you can see the difference between the Google Map base layer in the back, um, which is uh, very low resolution and very old, and the new information that the community was using to push the government to acknowledge how many people live there and what social services they needed. This project really kind of blew up during the, the BP oil spill where um, uh, we got a call from a shrimp boat fisherman who said, please come down to the, to the, to the Gulf region because we think there's going to be a big cover up. And so quickly we trained up 12 or 13 community groups, bucket brigade groups, to take very high resolution images. You can actually count the birds on this bird sanctuary that is about to get destroyed. Um, uh, and have the largest visual database of the oil spill, which has been used in several lawsuits against BP. Um, they went on to kind of pivot this to become an entire community-based uh, pollution and uh, um, uh, environmental organization with people contributing from about you know, 28 uh, different countries in the world and constantly coming up with new technologies for spectrometry, et cetera, that can basically make data arguments for the community in terms of community defense. When we first showed the, the balloon mapping to Google, they kind of laughed because they've got these $100 million satellites. But now if you go to Google base layers, these community mapped uh, uh, maps are actually served by Google. So this is Kampala, Uganda, where I did a mapping session. So, um, you know, so this is kind of what I think is possible in a, a sort of a blue sky research environment like the Media Lab where I was working. Um, and and I, I'm, I would argue that Europe kind of needs to have something that's basically baking strong European values into the next generations of technology so that 15 years from now we're not having a discussion about whatever it is that's coming out of Silicon Valley the next time. So.
thanks. Um, so, I think um, we should open this for, for questions and discussion. Um, you, you might want to uh, contribute to, to this. Maybe you see it uh, different. But um, I think for me, personally, the big, the big question is how, uh, how if everything seems to be broken around, uh, how can we unbroke this? And um, what would be the right configuration for, for, for uh, a space that uh, in Europe could, um, could work in this kind of uh, way in, uh, in journalism? Or community information. <laughs> Everything is broken. <laughs> oh, just turn on. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much for sharing um, uh, your projects. Uh, before this session, there was a session um, about design thinking methods and how to formulate the problems and understand your audience's uh, problems. And I'm wondering. Um, I want to know more about the process of you picking projects and um, how many projects are you working on um, right now? Maybe you can elaborate on that a bit more. Sure. Uh, so the work that I showed was from my time at MIT um, in the States and uh, we were you know, not a particularly big group. There were about, um, at any time, maybe eight to ten graduate students, a couple of postdocs and uh, uh, that's about it. Um, typically what we would do is we would um, we'd balance between having a technologically based idea, so you see some new technology coming out and you say there's an opportunity there, or doing kind of work in communities, uh, field work and looking at community needs. Um, so, so it was always a kind of a balance. I think good ideas come from both sides of that, right? Design thinking, if I may, you know, it's it's the work of consultants, um, groups like IDEO, Frog Design, et cetera, um, a company that I started at called Doblin Group as well, um, and 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 so it, it it tends to have a kind of a consultant mentality. I I think we strive to get beyond that to say because I think technologists have a tremendous amount of um, you know uh, arrogance. They feel like they can move into any kind of place, change everyone's life, uh, you know, no problem. Um, and I think, I think this kind of disruptive, like this, this treasuring of disruption, there's some really nice models arguing against that. So I would say rather than design thinking, we were looking at like the Nordic participatory design te technique. So this was a movement in the 1960s when computers were first coming to, I think it started in printing in Denmark and, and Norway. And there were these strong unions, and the unions were basically looking at this and saying, you want us to sit down at desks with, you know, with, with public publishing software and fire most of us, um, but have us work on this system. That's not how we work. We work by getting together in the morning. The company tells us what needs to be done, and then we as workers make a decision about how to do that, and we divvy that up. And so for, for the last you know, 30, 40 years, in, in the, the best alternative that I've ever seen to Silicon Valley ideas about how people should work have been coming from this participatory design movement. Actually, design thinking borrows hugely from participatory design, but kind of takes the political element out of it, unfortunately, because I think that was really important. So I'd say that we, we drew inspiration from things like participatory design, from some you know, really interesting work that happened in Canada, as alternatives to the Silicon Valley model, but it's hard to find those alternatives. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered very well. But yeah. And I, I would add here because to give a practical example. So, for investigative journalists to work together, they need a system where they can come in and let's say search a leaked data set, right? So, because there were no systems um, that they could use, um, a lot of us started to look around what they can repurpose or build from scratch. 
But so if you come with this perspective of design thinking, what uh, technologies would, uh, or what the design thinking theory will teach you is, okay, you ask the users uh, what they need or observe them and then build something. And they would say, I want this feature and I want the other feature, whatever. Um, but um, that doesn't cover um, the uh, discussion and sort of reflection of what, what are the implications of what you're building. So for instance, if you build a search uh, tool for uh, a few hundred people, and they tell you, but we want to have access to our, um, to bookmark uh, our findings and to have access to our history of searches, then you build in the system a surveillance uh, possibility for those who are managing the system. And uh, basically that's not part of the, uh, the process when you do this design thinking approach. And of course, if you are uh, building it as for clients, uh, you don't want to discuss with your clients that you have this and that other uh, capacities because they insisted to have a certain feature. Hi, I have one question and one reflection, thinking out loud thing. So the question will be for Beatrix, if you've uh, thought about the governance of the network that you imagine, so how to kind of make on a local level, on an international level, would it be something in your mind that is just reserved to journalists or how much is there a part of lobbying somehow in there? How much is it uh, collaborate lobbying? So lobbying. Uh, yeah, how much it would be uh, inclusive yeah. of, I don't know, members of governments or representatives mm. of governments? Is it, is it something you have been focusing on or? That's, that's one of the big questions, the, how to govern the governance within networks. And we, as we see networks emerge and develop, as journalists, we, we develop a network because there is a need to work across borders or, or some other need. And then we have to, you know, so we learn by doing and we learn by reflecting on what we do. And so what this space we're talking about here would be also a space of reflection of what kind of networks are emerging. When you, when you talk with some of the journalists who are actually working in these cross-border teams, they don't reflect very much on what kind of network they're in, whether this is centralized or whether it's decentralized. Uh, typically in the journalism networks, it's journalists involved and no lobbyists, no government, no advocacy. Um, but again, if you work across borders, there would be different views on, uh, in some countries, obviously you can work together with civil society organizations and maintain your editorial independence. And in other countries, you would like, no, 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 this is a no-go. Um, typically, you would not work with government uh, because that's, that's, that's classic a no-go in most countries. Um, but again, the, the journalists are creating something and oftentimes they don't have the time or the space or the group of people who would reflect on it on the meta level. There are very few who, who then reflect on it on the meta level. They have success. They see that there are reactions to they unveil something, there are political reactions, there are other reactions, court cases or so, and they move on to the next research and the next research and they make things happen, but it's, it's, a, it's a learning by doing, but it's also a learning without necessarily analyzing, reflecting, because there is no space. This is, it's an emerging community, an emerging methodology, but there is no, not so much reflection on it yet, and it would be really good to have a space where we can reflect on it, including which technology models we, we develop for it. I would add to this because actually this is a really important question and if you ask, um, if you ask any journalist usually the answer is I don't care, I just don't care, I want to get the things done. And, but uh, these growing networks are governed first by two type of um, rules that were invented by the military. One is this, like most of the non-profits registered in the uh, active here in this space of uh, investigative journalism across borders are registered in the US. So they follow these uh, Roberts rules um, that a few people know how they actually work. Um, and second, they uh, are in the non-profit realm where they have to um, submit 
um, uh, details about their work for uh, the donors who are usually uh, following um, a monitoring system and that monitoring system, this logical uh, framework approach that was also designed in the aftermath of uh, Vietnam by the military to understand how they could uh, quantify their uh, support. And then that was renamed uh, in different ways and exported towards Europe and adopted by all these uh, big uh, development agencies and all, by all these uh, big donors. That is how this non-profit uh, work in investigative journalism really functions. And the second side of it is the technology used. The journalists are and networks are uh, uh, governed by such technologies and nobody's actually questioning uh, when they are invited to enter a system, what are their rights, right? Uh, we do, and journalists do question now Facebook, Twitter, and other big uh, companies, but they don't question their own networks. tools and their own tech spaces. And uh, network is about control access. Uh, access, uh, to control the access on who can get in and who can, who should be kicked out. And usually that has a really big power in the hands of a very few. So that also is not very inviting for uh, criticism because you, if you criticize, you will not get access there anymore. That's a really interesting question. What's your background, if I may ask? This is a mm -hmm. small no. enough group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then maybe I would jump also to the out loud reflection. So I uh, ask this question because I work mostly with uh, European funds for technology research and communicating technology research. And so what I see, for instance, at the moment is there is this big talking about blockchains and decentralization, et cetera, et cetera. But most of it, it's, it's completely pointless because they make, um, they think that just a certain kind of infrastructure will be enough to guarantee decentralization, right? There are a lot of decentralized, so-called decentralized or blockchain-led uh, systems that in the end they are extremely centralized. Sorry. So I think that uh, so it's important when you build a network to think of the governance at a very early stage. Otherwise, you can absolutely. And and you know, there's uh, a lot of nice work happening around you know the the governance that's built into technology. And you know, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have Google. One of the, I mean, the sixth largest site last time I checked in the world is Wikipedia, which has a completely different governance model, right? I mean, Wikipedia is far, far more permeable, right? It has problems, of course, but, you know, you can actually affect Wikipedia at, you know, at both at the level of an individual piece of information, but also at the level of governance if you spend some time working at it. And what a profound difference from that to Facebook. So, you know, if you, if you look at governance, it's really, really, really critical. Are you, what, what uh, are you involved in Horizon 2020 or what, what kind yeah, of? Yeah, yeah, I've been involved in. With a, CAPS or? Yeah, okay. I was I, there I, uh, from the very beginning. I know some of your colleagues. I yeah, think. yeah, Maurizio yeah. Telly probably, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But so just yeah. to conclude and also to leave the floor to other people, but uh, to go back to your original point about the problem of Europe, I think that there's, um, there are data about Europe uh, the, the problem of Europe is that it, has, it, has, it is an excellence in research, but it struggles to bring it to the market. Mm -hmm. And a big problem is that uh, somehow this research never builds, uh, let's say, a client. Uh, there's never an, uh, a, qu a question asked beforehand, who this will s serve? And I think that journalists can play a, re a really nice role here, especially journalists working with communities in building this client before. And, and Client is a very commercial term, but it's just to say that uh, where CAPS somehow mm -hmm. failed in working beforehand with communities, you can really build technology that is meaningful for people and not just a top-down I think, I think supposed solution. I have, I have my own ideas. I, I, I won't say that CAPS failed because this is getting taped, but um, I, I was, so CAPS, sorry, is a, uh, stands for Collective Awareness Platforms. Um, and it's one of the one of the kind of streams in kind of next generation internet uh, of Horizon 2020, which is about 80 billion. Uh, I learned from Stefan. Um, <laughs> he always follows the money. Um, about 80 billion euros uh, over a period of four years for kind of technology funding. And I remember I was at a lunch with several people who had won CAPS grants, and I was asking, "So, what's your team like? You know, how, do you, how are you doing the work?" And after I'd heard three different of these kind of configurations, well, we have an economist from here, we have so-and-so, 
I, I just feel like, oh, so you don't actually, none of you actually intend to build this. Like, you don't actually expect to have, uh, you know, a market. Uh, and they were all like, no, no, no. <laughs> He's so naive. <laughs> you know, like, and it was, I mean, it was like the scales fell for my eyes. I realized that, like, actually, there isn't a model in, in like, this kind of mixture of academy and, and startups for actually imagining that this could be a competitor to Facebook. Like, no one... No one was even imagining that possibility. And I, I find that really, really interesting. So that's, I mean, that's a little bit of what we're trying to say. When you, when you think about getting this European funding, you're basically, through the log frame approach, you're, you're committing yourself to six years or so on one of these you know, three-year grants, right? You have to start about a year before. Um, you do the application. Maybe you do it twice before you get the funding. Um, you know, and then it's you know, six months before you get started and then you work for three years. It's just, it's such a long period where you can't actually do that pivot, which is so important in this work. And you also have to have the entire idea almost. And it's, it's like in the US, you have a joke about National Institute of Health that you have to apply for the grant for research that you've already done, but you were careful not to publish because the grant is so restrictive in terms of what's permissible that you basically can't be blue sky. And I think that this is what we're arguing is that there's a real problem that's systemic to the funding, and how do we get beyond that? How do we actually develop a, a really different approach towards research where you can be much more responsive? So if you all take out your wallets now. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> so thank you guys for, for the talk first. Then a couple of questions related to each other for, to, to Chris about the, the technologies you guys were developing at the MIT. Uh, I was wondering whether you, you guys were, uh, ex uh, were explicitly aiming at some particular political um, effects of the te technologies you were developing while working at them. Like were you trying to put into the design and, and the use something that you hoped would have these political implications? And then also when you when you released these technologies, uh, under which licenses did you did you do that? How MIT tried to monetize them? Or, or sure. Um, so everything that we did at the Center for Civic Media was done under um, uh, GPL two three, depending on the year, or a Faro. Um, so we did everything free open licensed, uh, which was the first time, like we had a lot of trouble getting that through MIT, but it was something fundamental that we tried to do. One of my students actually wrote the Afero uh, um, license, so that, that kind of helped us <laughs> with the early uptake. Um, uh, Benjamin Mako Hill, who actually worked in Italy a lot. Um, uh, so, um, so, and then, I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? Pol particular political effects. Yes, I mean, um, you know, not to put too fine a line on it, before the, the Knight Foundation came to us, we were basically trying to fuck with the Bush administration. I mean, it was just uh, an awful group of people doing terrible things around the world. And um, so, yeah, uh, we, we, we were looking at particular political effects, whether it was party political or, you know, maybe a more kind of vague politics, I would, I would argue the latter. Um, but it wasn't a coincidence that we, you know, were doing things. Uh, what, you know, the very first project I did when I got to MIT was I was looking at how important drones were. Um, I, I got there September 7th, 2001, so I had like three days before 9-11, and then the campus was like locked down. St FBI agents came to take some of my students' books away. Um, I mean, it was amazing to watch what's the United States 22nd biggest military contractor, uh, you know, like as a, in the guise of a university. So, um, so I built a teleoperated war journalist because I knew that the Taliban hated journalists and the Pentagon hated journalists and it was going to be this like really bizarre thing as the war in, Afghan in Afghanistan started. Um, and it was kind of a joke, but it was also kind of funny because it really pissed off the people who later judged me for tenure. Um, uh, uh, and, but, but, you know, it was, it was basically, yes, we, we believe in journalism and we believe that there should be a way for journalists to work in the war in Afghanistan. Is that party political? I mean, yes, it was in a way, but also not, so. So I think, uh, we, we have to close it if there is no other question.
Oh, okay. Well, thanks for coming. I hope it was interesting. And we, we, we have another panel tomorrow talking about the same thing. No, <laughs> but almost. It's upstream, I would say. We're talking about values and, um, uh, in, in, in technology and journalism. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's at the end of the day. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>